Hello, I'm David Mandy, president of O&M Partners, and I, I want to welcome everyone to, uh, to this uh, Cisco Development Corp's uh, town hall webinar. We certainly appreciate your attendance. Uh, Cisco Development Corp trades under the symbols ODV on the TSX Venture. Uh, for those new to these broadcasts, about six years before COVID, uh, O&M recognized the sea change in, in non-deal investor marketing. Um, a whole new generation of self-directed investors that can't be found only in the key financial centers. People are receiving information um, at home and in offices that used to be geared and available basically to professional investors. I like to tell people that, you know, companies go public, but they are constantly also have to continue to go public, uh, particularly with their non-deal investors. Um, the questions of uh, the Q&A for, are for everyone. Uh, this broadcast um, will answer questions you probably didn't know to ask. Uh, questions can be easily asked uh, by going to the question portal of GoToWebinar, or you can email us. Uh, be assured that if your questions are not answered, we will be back to you in a timely manner. Uh, for those who dialed in with your phone, the only way you can hear the pre-recorded introductory presentation is on your computer speakers. Um, if that's not possible, you'll be able to hear the main presentation after five minutes. So oh, we ask you to please stay tuned. Um, before we turn to our host, I'd like to introduce our introductory speaker today, Paul Harris, editor of the Mining Journal. He's been a mining sector researcher, analyst, and reporter for over 16 years, focuses on the gold and copper sectors, sectors excuse me, um, and a real pleasure to, uh, to uh, introduce today. Paul, we'll turn it over to you. Twenty twenty one got off to a bright start with gold shooting about two thousand dollars an ounce before rapidly setting back to one thousand eight hundred and fifty dollars an ounce, which seems to be a level it is comfortable with uh, for the time being. With much of the world experiencing strong second waves of the COVID nineteen pandemic and extensive lockdowns as a result, economic disruption continues, as do efforts by governments to ameliorate this through economic stimulus such as the 1.9 trillion US dollars package the new administration in the US is looking to implement. With several COVID-19 vaccines starting to be deployed, there is the prospect of life becoming more normal as 2021 progresses. Some observers think this means that gold prices have peaked as the gradual return to normal economic activity will see downward pressure on prices as investor confidence returns and interest migrates to other sectors of the market. Others view the bigger picture of mounting government indebtedness and the inflationary potential of all the economic stimulus as continuing to bode well for gold with the prospect of prices pushing even higher going forward. Whatever your view, gold at $1,850 an ounce is boom time for the majority of gold producers, many of whom are enjoying margins of about $1,000 per ounce and are putting record amounts of cash on their balance sheets each quarter paying down debt and ramping up sharehold returns via dividends and share repro repurchases in the process. But gold is a non-renewable resource. Deposits become depleted and new ounces need to be found and brought into production to maintain production levels. 2020 was a good year for gold exploration companies and developers who have found the equity markets open for much of the year and in a way that has not been seen for many years. Investors have tasked explorers and developers with being more aggressive in drilling their projects to rapidly advance them to resource definition and onto economic studies and on to mine build decisions. And they, by and large, have responded. However, investment has generally preferred safe and well-known jurisdictions, such as British Columbia and Canada, where there is a familiar and well-trodden permitting process, access to skilled labor and technical services, and infrastructure, such as roads, and power lines already in situ. The exploration results out of British Columbia this year and last year have been considerable as the rate of activity has increased, which will help ensure that it remains a center for new mine development. Gold miners want to build and operate mines in British Columbia, and consequently, the province has seen several projects advancing towards production as gold mines can be built in British Columbia, with a recent example being the Bruce Jack mine, and more mines will certainly follow. Higher gold prices have also resulted in some corporate restructuring 
as companies seek to surface unrealized value through the spin out of new companies, a process that typically establishes a resulting issuer with a handpicked management, tight capital structure, funding route, and a specific project or projects to advance and develop. In short, everything necessary to be successful. The custom built nature of some of these spin outs means that they and their projects have been significantly de risked and therefore have a very clear pathway towards generating shareholder value. For developers, now is a great time to be building gold mines. High gold prices mean development projects by and large have high potential margins and therefore very attractive economics, while low interest rates mean financing projects is very affordable. High gold prices are also reflected somewhat in higher company share prices, which means less dilutive equity financings to help finance mine builds. And for those looking for royalty or stream financing, the growing numbers of players in that space will only see terms become more favorable. Thank you, Paul Harris, um, the editor of the Mining Journal. I really appreciated your introductory remarks. And now it's a pleasure to turn to our host, Sean Rusin, who is the, the chairman of the board of directors and the chief executive officer of Cisco Development. Um, Sean has over 30 years of experience in the mining industry. Um, as founder, president, and CEO and director of Cisco Mining Corp, he was responsible for developing the strategic plan uh, for the development of Canadian Malartic Mine. He also led efforts for the maximization of shareholder value in the sale of Cisco Mining Corp, which resulted in the creation of Cisco royalties. Um, Mr. Rusin is an active participant in the resource sector and in the formation of new companies to explore for mineral deposits in Canada as well as internationally. Um, Sean has, Mr. Ruzzi, he's been um, recognized by many for his, all his achievements. He's received the award from the Mines and Money of Americas for the best chief, chief executive officer in North America. Um, I've worked with Sean for many years and I can attest to that fact. Um, he's also top 20 most influential individuals in uh, global mining. Um, so on that note, it's a real pleasure to turn the call over to Sean. Well, thank you very much, David. I uh, hope everybody can uh, can see me and we can see the uh, the screen here. Um, yeah, as... you look good, Sean. Everything's good. Okay, perfect. Um, I also joined today uh, by the president of the Cisco Development Corporation, Chris Loader. Uh, Chris and I uh, started working together back in 1987 in West Africa. Uh, he went off to have a career in the majors with Anglo Gold, uh, and I went off to uh, to do private equity and to build uh, the Canadian Malartic Mine. Um, so just by way of history of, uh, of the group, uh, Dave summed it up well. Um, our call, card, calling card is we built Canada's largest gold mine uh, by ounces produced per year, 700,000 ounces a year, currently owned by Yamana Agnico. Uh, we found that project for $88,888 in 2004. Uh, and we built it into one of the largest uh, open pit gold mines in the world in 2011. Uh, sold it to uh, Yamana Agnico in 2014 and it started a Cisco Gold Royalties. Uh, and in that uh, process, we acquired what we call the accelerator group of companies. Uh, and this uh, Cisco development is really the benefactor of all the work that went in uh, to the first six years. And we've been involved uh, in the Caribou Gold project, which we're going to present to you today. Um, and this is uh, this is what we're uh, we're looking at today in terms of. Hopefully I can get rid of these. Sorry, I seem to have, seem to have closed the presentation somehow. Scott, we're on that. Yeah, I will um, take back presenter mode while you find it. Uh, right. There you go. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so what we are in the process of doing, obviously, and can you guys see my presentation in full, or is there a screen over top of it? Nope, nope it's you're in full. Fair, Sean. Okay, perfect. Uh, so today we're going to present to you the Cisco Development Plan. Uh, we, we've uh, relaunched this company under the symbol ODV on the TSX Venture in November. Uh, three subsequent financings for a total of $205 million uh, raised, all hard dollars, uh, no flow through in that mix uh, for the company to advance, uh, namely the, the Caribou Gold Project in Central British Columbia 
and also a heap leach project that we have in Mexico. Uh, we believe we're on track to take the vision of this project uh, currently at 3.2 million ounces of measured and indicated another 3.8 million ounces of inferred resources collectively within the company um, and turn it into the next mid-tier, especially with a Canadian anchor. Uh, the Caribou Gold project is ex extremely important project uh, in the space as it's one of the few projects that we see that has uh, probably 20, 10 to 20 years of exploration left to go, even though we're already at a significant resource there. Uh, with uh, with almost 6 million ounces uh, uh, reported to the market so far. In terms of our market cap, uh, we're sitting at about uh, $900 million, $950 million market cap today. Uh, within the company, we have a $200 million of cash uh, on hand, as well as $122 million uh, in equities, uh, giving us total liquidity of about $322 million Canadian uh, as we said today, so very well financed uh, and no debt. So we're in perfect shape to launch uh, what we think is uh, the next mid-tier uh, for the space and also to highlight um, the value of the Caribou Gold Project, which uh, has a long and rich history, having started right after the uh, California 49ers. Uh, it was a placer camp discovered in the 1860s uh, and mining has uh, resulted in about 4 million ounces of gold being extracted both from hard rock and placer uh, over the last uh, over the last 140 years. Uh, so we're the next generation uh, to figure it out and Chris Loader and his technical team uh, have really cracked the genetic code of this deposit and we're not dealing with just a project, we're dealing with a mining camp. Uh, this represents uh, about 2,000 square kilometers uh, of mineral rights and also uh, is situated uh, over about 50 miles of mineralized trend that uh, the Chris and the team uh, have been able to drill test and to map out in 2D uh, along that longer strike. To put that in context, the entire Cortez trend is 51 miles. Uh, so this is a big deal, it's a big project. I'm not saying this is the Cortez Hill, I'm just trying to give you a sense of scale. Uh, and we think that there's a lot of ounces to be discovered here uh, over and above of what we've done. And we've announced a 90,000 meter uh, drill program, which is about 180,000, uh, sorry, about uh, uh, 300,000 feet uh, of drilling uh, for this year. And based on the results that we get from that, we would continue on. And we think that uh, we're going to be drilling here for many, many years to come. Currently have uh, 10 drills on site headed for 14. Uh, and then we'll hope to add to that afterwards. Uh, a bit on the enterprise value here, uh, as we see on the scale, we're giving you a bit of a peer group review. Uh, and we've included CapEx and uh, uh, to build these projects into production, currently trading at 0.7. If we build it out, if we add the CapEx to it, we get to about one. Uh, but we're very much on the low end of the scale in terms of, of what the valuation of this project should be. Uh, and we uh, we think that we have a lot of upside. And you know, for shareholders here today, uh, this is a, a meaningful time to come into the project. Uh, we still have a relatively tight shareholder base. Uh, with most people having come in in the recent financing because the company was held 100% by a Cisco Gold Royalties until the IPO. Uh, Cisco still owns about 76% of the company uh, and they're not trading the stock. So right now it's the stock that was issued in this financing that's available uh, on the market. We're looking for this company to start out at about 275,000 ounces of production uh, with the uh, Caribou project coming into product, full production in 2023-24. Uh, and we also have some interim uh, uh, production uh, that's just starting right now with uh, stacking ore in front of our 100% owned QR mill from our, 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 our Bonanza Ledge project. So we hope to pour gold here in the second quarter. Uh, and we're looking for interim uh, production of about 30,000 ounces a year. Uh, during the permitting cycle to get to the 2022 mine build. Uh, in terms of you know what we're doing, uh, we have the cash on hand uh, to do a large part of the equity financing that's required for this project. We have the team to do it. We've been here and we've done this before. Uh, we built uh, the Canadian Malartic asset. We've also been involved in about uh, 13 different mine builds across, across the team. Uh, and we are currently working on not only this project, but the Mexico project uh, to get this into production. Uh, in terms of our valuations here, uh, we believe that uh, if you go do a little bit of research, you'll see that it's quite an interesting 
company, I like to say that this project is a big company project with small company CapEx uh, at $444 million to build a plus 200,000 ounce a year mine uh, with at least 12 years of, of mining on it. Uh, we think that this is a, a unique opportunity. A lot of that has to do with the existing infrastructure that's already in place and the equipment that we've been able to capitalize along the way. Um, this next table shows an NPV to CapEx ratio. Uh, and what you see here is the CapEx based on a percent of the, cap, of, the, uh, uh, of, the of the market cap. Uh, so obviously very compelling in our case uh, at 1.8.9 being the average ratio. Uh, we're well below that, and I think that capital intensity, you know, sort of looks to the balance sheet, the need to issue capital through equity, um, you know. So I think what we've got right now is uh, we're in very strong position, and the company is looks a lot like it will after we finish building the mine in terms of the balance sheet right now. Uh, we will take on some debt, but it should be paid relatively quickly because it won't be too much. Um, you know, the overall mine build at 444 million for phase one. Um, if we take that into US dollars, about 320 million uh, that we'll have, and we'll have a significant amount of sunk capital by the time uh, we do get there. So, all in all, uh, we've given you another uh, table of comparables today um, on overall ounces. Uh, we sit at about 7 million ounces total in the company uh, right now, which puts us just below Orla, Sabina, Midas, and Armitus. Uh, however, we are a, a four to six gram underground ore body uh, with high grade pods uh, to add to that and relatively large mining widths uh, uh, for an underground mine of this size. In terms of our development capex, as you can see, we're showing about uh, 350 million US here, Canadian dollars here, but we've upsized that to, from 4,000 tons a day to 4,750. And we've included all the other things that we think might have to go into infrastructure to get to that larger number. In terms of a Cisco development's uh, position and the life of, life of mine average price, you can see we rank quite well here. Um, and we're, uh, we're on the process right now of seeing how and uh, how much we have effort we can put into expanding uh, our existing resource and ramping up. <clears throat> the advantage we have is we are ramp access relatively shallow uh, as we as we get into this project, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. The next slide, I think our presenter uh, that introduced uh, covered it off pretty well. Uh, in terms of bullish factors for gold, $277 trillion, or 365% of global GDP sitting uh, in, uh, in the world's total debt at this point in time. Total public debt in the U.S. now just a tick under $28 trillion, uh, and $23 trillion as of 2020. Um, so this continues to climb with the complications that we all see in COVID-19. Uh, this risks to uh, continue for a while, and especially if this virus mutates, uh, and, and I sure hope it doesn't uh, go any, any get any worse. Uh, but we have to assume that uh, uh, the world is going to have to pay the bill no matter what it is. So these things are our are, are force as we go forward, and the indebtedness of all nations and the risk of fiat currency devaluation is significant. Everybody's trying to sell their, their pots and pans to each other. And if your currency is too high, you won't be able to transact. Uh, so we have a bit of a devaluation uh, race underway. And uh, you know that's a, always an interesting time when the Western world decides to devalue against itself. And certainly China can't afford to have an expensive currency right now. Uh, all this bolds well for gold, because as we know, there's no dilution in gold other than what we bring above ground by mining. Uh, which is traditionally an increase of supply of about 1.2 percent per year uh, historically but getting harder and harder to do uh, as the shallower easier to mine gold deposits uh, are all uh, uh, coming to their life their the their mine life end um, in terms of global liquidity across total assets i won't get too much into this slide because i want to do stick to the presentation uh, but more than happy to speak to that in the q a period if we get there our focus really is the Caribou Gold Project uh, and the San Antonio Project in Mexico. Uh, for free in the portfolio, we have a large land package in James Bay that surrounds the the Newmont Eleanor mine uh, that we acquired when we took uh, when we bought Virginia Gold. We also have a large uh, land package near Guerrero that surrounds the Torex and Equinox Los Vilos mines uh, in the Guerrero uh, State uh, that we have uh, we have some options on. We'll be looking to. Uh, 
probably joint venture out the, those two uh, exploration packages uh, while we focus on the Caribou Gold project uh, currently sitting at measuring indicated at 2.9 million ounces of 4.7 grams, which is fully diluted for mining widths and another in for two and a half million ounces as we move forward here. So all in all, you know, we're dominantly, uh, I would say two thirds to seven eighths of our value sits at Caribou right now. And we have a nice easy project in Mexico called San Antonio that we'll get into a little bit later. Um, but it's a one, two, three process for us to build value and, and get the share price moving now. Uh, first production is expected, as I said, at the end of Q1, or early Q2 uh, of this year from uh, Bonanza Ledge. Uh, we previously mined there in 2018. We carried out test mining, produced 22,000 ounces there. We're currently have an underground development program that's uh, that has uh, 60,000 ounces ready to, to ship to the mill. And we're just in the final permitting process to release the mill. Uh, here this month or this quarter uh, and get that into production. The San Antonio project is a low capex, about 25 million US dollars, uh, heat bleach operation that we uh, that we acquired. It was previously a copper project and was tied up in some litigation. Uh, we spent about two and a half years and we were able to liberate it and uh, we're very excited about this project. Um, it's quite high grade. It's about 1.2 grams a ton. Uh, for about a million ounces, all open pitable, uh, with the oxide the oxide component getting plus 90% recoveries, uh, and even the transition and sulfide zones getting into the 60% recoveries. Uh, so you know we all like our yellow dump trucks. This is simple mining, really low capex for what we're getting out of it, and there'll be more to come in the presentation on that one. Of course, the big show is number three uh, production to start in 2023 at the Caribou Gold Project that uh, Chris and uh, and Maggie have been leading the team in terms of getting us the resource infill drilling there. Uh, and the permit permitting track is well along as well with IBAs having been signed with our First Nation partners and our host communities. Uh, the mill, uh, the, the bulk of the commutation circuit, the crushers and, and uh, mills have been purchased. Um, so we have quite a bit of visibility on what we're doing. Uh, here on the, the left-hand portion of the slide, uh, this is the exciting part for us. This is a 2,000 square kilometers of mineral rights. Uh, so, you know, that, to put that in scale, that would be like owning the entire Timmins camp or the Valdor camp um, or the Red Lake camp. Um, you know, this is this is a huge uh, land package to own, and we own it 100%. Um, you know, with our partners at Cisco Gold Royalties, we've been able to secure the land. And as you see in the insert here, we're quite well advanced with an underground ramp into the project. Uh, we're we're advancing about seven to eight meters of underground uh, development per day as we speak today, and a significant amount of infrastructure in place already. As we say, there, this is a brownfield site, and it's also a logging site. Uh, West Fraser, the local logging company, has carried out uh, clear-cut operations in almost all the areas that we work. And Chris and his team have been successful in getting more than 3,000 uh, drill site permits uh, permitted. Uh, which is quite extraordinary. Uh, and that is because all the land is for the most part where we're working impacted. Uh, as you can see, we have a portal, we have we have underground operations, and we also have the QR mill uh, at the bottom right, which is about a 1,200 to 1,200 day mill, depending on rock hardness, uh, that we recently did an up a refurbishment on. And we're looking to start that mine by that mill back up in March. Um, and we should be able to run about 600 to 1,000 tons a day from our current underground operations uh, while we get ready for the big show, uh, which will start in 2022 with the construction of a 4,750 ton a day operation underground. In terms of how it breaks up, uh, you know, we have this Bonanza Ledge interim uh, at about five grams a ton uh, for the next two years while we're in the permitting and construction mode. Uh, we'll be able to run this mill. Uh, and hopefully it creates some uh, some strong cash flow. Uh, and we also have a significant amount of exploration outside of that 60,000 ounces in the current mine plan. The overall resource in this area called Bonanza Ledge is over 400,000 ounces, uh, closer to 500,000 ounces, and we really just stopped drilling on it uh, while we focused on the bigger project. Uh, in terms of annual production, you can see here we have year one at 77,000 ounces, year two at 193. This is based on our 2019 uh, PEA study that we published and assumed 2 million ounces of, of reserves and it was also operating at 4,000 tons per day 
we're currently online to permit at 4,750 tons a day. Uh, and Chris and the exploration team are doing the infill drilling right now with the 10 drills uh, to get us to 3 million ounces in the mine plan, which will set the stage uh, for an increase in that annual expect production expected. So a lot of value drivers uh, going into the project over the next 12 to 18 months. <clears throat> so in, in terms of what we're doing here, we have a developing mining camp and this uh, cross section is really, uh, you know, quite an extraordinary uh, piece of geology that uh, Chris and the team have, have gone a long way to, to understanding and, and by, by understanding it, they've been able to be, to do predictive drilling uh, in terms of you know knowing where to drill and, and hitting what they expect to hit. Uh, so maybe I'll stop here and I'll pass it to Chris to give a little bit of an overview of what we're looking at uh, on this cross section. Chris, are you, is your audio on? Yeah, can everybody, can you hear me? I can. Okay, good. Uh, hi everybody, I'm up here in Wells at our Caribou Gold Project. And yeah, this, uh, this catalyst event that took place in 2016 for us uh, in the Cisco group, on the project was really breaking the controls of mineralization, understanding what was controlling it, and as Sean mentioned, making it predictive. So we went from a, from a very low uh, hit rate in our drilling, sort of 20%-ish, uh, to about 80 to 90%, and we've maintained that ever since. Um, the real potential here is just that the predictability of it is, is, is along that whole trend that's uh, shown there, the existing trend, and then now on the new parallel trend, which we identified two years ago. Um, there's hundreds of targets you have to drill along here. They tend to repeat every five to 800 meters, these mineralized zones, and they tend to be somewhere between half a million and a million ounces down to about three, three, mil, down to, about three to 400 meters depth. So there's a lot of potential there. We have drilling in below these zones uh, of our resources right now. What you see there in that long section in our core zone is down to about an average of about 350 meters. We have approximately 6 million ounces there, 5.9 million ounces. Um, and we've drilled down for another three to 400 meters below that with a with substantial amount of drilling now, not to a resource level. We're still working on that, but just uh, there's a potential to, to, to double that in the, only in the area there and not even talking about along the trend. So that's why we've called this thing really a generational project because it'll be around for generations. This is a really unique opportunity. We have good access. Uh, we have a strong understanding. We have all the mineral rights that you need here. Everything's, everything's controlled by us. And uh, we've got strong community support and First Nation support here. Thanks, Chris. And you know, in terms of, of what you see on your map, um, the only real intense drilling that we've done so far is in this green area in the box, and it represents about uh, about 3.7 kilometers of intense drilling out of an 83 kilometer long total trend between the existing trend and the new parallel trend. So all in all, uh, Mr. Loader and the, the exploration crew are, are going to be at this for a while now. Next slide here it shows you the site overview and uh, where the mill is going to go. Uh, there was a previously existing mill on this property that was removed in, in the 1980s. Uh, we're reestablishing our new mill on the Brownfield site to reduce our footprint. Uh, in terms of our ESG, this project will be uh, a crowd leader in terms of uh, what we're trying to achieve in our footprint management, the technologies we're deploying, and the integration within our community and the surrounding uh, areas that we're working on. Uh, we're going to be working with a, a local architect, First Nations architect, that uh, that has come up with several concepts, and we've got a lot of our footprint is actually underground, uh, and we're reduced it to the existing footprint. And as you can see uh, in this area, this is the old tailings area here. Uh, we'll be encapsulating that at some point in time uh, and our main area of footprint here will be going back underground uh, with almost all of our tailings that are created by the flotation circuit and then the sulfide component the concentrate will be shipped to our existing qr mill uh, so we'll reduce the the, the need for an on-surface tailing spawn from this mine which is quite unique and we'll be using the dry stack tailings uh, to recover to uh, Rehabilitate our QR mill site that is fully permitted and has a tailing spawn, uh, as well as a cyanidation license. What that does is allows us to build this mill uh, with the without a tailing spawn in first generation, and without the need to uh, to put cyanide uh, into the circuit, as we're just using a basic crushing, grinding, flotation uh, as the main milling method. We do, however, have a unique thing that we're doing 
uh, in the front of it, which is called ore sorting, which is very environmentally friendly as well, um, is it because it, uh, it sorts the ore in a coarse fashion. The rocks are more than three eighths of an inch in size. Uh, and by using X-ray uh, and some optical review, uh, just like the uh, the X-ray machine at the L at the airport that looks at your bags, uh, we X-ray the rocks and we select the ones that have sulfides in them, because almost 90, 98 to 99 percent of all the gold in this deposit is associated with the sulfides. Uh, so it's a binary selection. Any piece of rock that has any sulfides that are pinged on the X-ray are sent to the uh, to the ore sort and the other the other uh, rocks are sent to the waste side and the net result of that is it rejects about 25 percent uh, of all the material that we mine uh, without us having to grind it into tailings and we're able to dispose of that material knowing that it has no sulfides in it so it's not acid generating uh, in our development waste so that's uh, that's why we don't have a big tailing spawn uh, is because we're rejecting 25 percent of the waste with this new technology it is extraordinarily economic. It costs us about a dollar fifty U.S. per ton to process through the ore sorter, uh, and we only use the ore sorter really on fifty percent of the material that we're mining. Uh, that is lower grade. All the higher grade uh, material that we do produce goes directly to our flotation circuit, a well-known technology uh, that everybody I think is familiar with. Uh, we produce a concentrate that gets shipped to the other mill that runs somewhere between twenty-eight and thirty-five grams. Uh, and obviously it will be higher in some places as we get in some of those high grade zones. Uh, as you can see, we've introduced underground crushing uh, and we've kept as many things from surface as possible as we develop this project uh, in our in our new ASG model. Um, what you see here is the QR mill. So we're taking advantage of this existing mill that was built by Ken Ross back in the 90s. Um, we've updated this mill. It's a pretty good uh, mill because it now has a flexibility to do both CIL and CIP. Uh, processing and the difference there is that you can handle ores that may have a little bit of graphite in them. It is uh, was engineered as a thousand ton per day mill, uh, but depending what you put into it, you can get more. Uh, so having this mill in the project obviously gives us huge advantage. We also have an assay lab here uh, that we don't, so we don't have to capitalize this component uh, of the project and allows us to get into production uh, right now as we speak. So we'll have a, a, some cash flow. Uh, from this property, this project, uh, as we go forward, um, in the, in terms of uh, what it does for us, obviously, you know, we're going to be uh, we're going to be able to process our concentrates there, and also uh, it gives the uh, the community and everybody the, the the knowledge that we use our existing infrastructure rather than just creating all new. The other thing that we're doing with this project is on page 18 here. Uh, is we're trying to go all electric, and I think we're going to we're going to achieve pretty close to 100% electric. Um, all of our drilling equipment uh, will be electric, and what you see here in the right-hand screen is a technology that uh, has been used in tunneling and and other uh, softer rock areas called road header development. Uh, and instead of having drill blasts, we're actually able to cut the rock with this machine uh, because we are in Jurassic Age rock here, which are a little bit softer than traditional gold mines. And this machine uh, operates as about 140 ton machine, uh, completely electric, uh, and it runs a significant amount of uh, software and allows it to mine while we're on changing shift, uh, while we're, you know, it doesn't generate any explosives, uh, so we don't have any ventilation break uh, when we can't mine uh, while we're waiting for after blast to blow out. And it also reduces the amount of contact water that's uh, contaminated uh, with the drill blast cycles of. Uh, of ammonium nitrate um, and uh, and anything that uh, we might be putting into that contact water by just having a purely uh, mechanical uh, mining method with no no explosives involved. So that's going to be uh, quite useful for us. We're doing traditional longitudinal retreat uh, with long hole stoping, so nothing out of the extraordinary, no uh, no no new technologies per, per se. Uh, on the actual mining method, just the equipment that we're using to execute that method uh, has been modernized. So we're looking at, you know, what I would call the ore multiplier stage here, where we're mining at 4,000 tons a day in our PA study. We'll be bringing that feasibility study back to you, as we say, in, in the summer of 2021 here in, in, in late summer. Um, and we'll be showing you the ore sorter technology. 
the advantage of the Orse order is we get about 50% rejection of everything we put in there uh, that we know is barren. So if we put three grams in there, the, the product comes out at six. If we put four grams in there, it comes out at eight grams. Um, and then when we use flotation, uh, we increase the grade uh, by a factor of about four and a half. Uh, so we produce, you know, we'll go from mining 4,000 tons a day in this model to mining 500 to producing 500 tons a day of concentrate, which will contain all of the sulfides. Uh, so that means that 3,500 tons doesn't have any contaminants <coughs> or potential ash generation uh, components to it. So it's quite an extraordinary mine uh, from that standpoint. We're able to produce a very clean waste product as well as a, and a very economic process. And as uh, we are all more focused on ESG, I think the fact that we're, we're able to contain the sulfides and reduce the amount of material that we're turning into tailings uh, significantly in this project. It's the first one of its type uh, that really does this. And I think that uh, this will be a leader in the mining industry, uh, much like the similar when we did in Canadian Malartic, where we did the uh, continuous closure plan uh, and we encapsulated the historic mining waste when we did that project and cleaned up about a $400 million problem with a new project. We're also looking at using our product here, which is going to be clean, to clean up and encapsulate some of the historic mining that was left there. Uh, from past generations. Uh, the ore sorter here, I've covered a lot of this. I say it's an increase in grade, uh, you know, by about 100% uh, in terms of what it rejects on the portion, and half of the ore goes direct to the flotation, so half of it goes to the ore sorter, which is why we have a net effect of reducing all the mine waste uh, that goes into the tailings pond uh, by about 25%. Um, in terms of processing uh, requirements, power and everything is also reduced by this methodology. Uh, we are in the process right now of hitting several milestones in the development of this project, which we believe are catalyst to value building. Um, and we've given you a bit of a summary of the history here. We really started on this project in 2016 with some exploration, trying to figure it out. Uh, the aha moment was really in 2018. Uh, and then uh, we had finished the acquisition of this project um, with uh, with by by buying out Eric Sprott at the time, um, and then we continued on with the drilling. We've executed about 650,000 meters of drilling to date, uh, and we've executed uh, quite a bit of the permitting cycle and the engineering and conception of the project is well advanced. Uh, and the vision for the study was to go from 4,000 to 470, 50 tons a day. Uh, because if we go past 4,750 tons a day, we'll, we'll, we'll step into the federal permitting process, uh, which we don't want to do uh, at this point in time. So all in all, uh, we're coming along quite well. And as we say, the vision for the camp is what I'm you know, hoping is going to be five to 10 underground mines with a central processing facility. And uh, we're really focused on what we've called the 10, five and three strategy is uh, do enough drilling to get us to 10 million ounces of resource overall, uh, get to a plan to put 500,000 ounces of gold production uh, in evidence uh, over the next five years, and to have 3 million ounces of mineable reserves uh, in our feasibility study by the middle of this summer. So all in all, these things uh, are quite doable. Uh, and uh, as long as we uh, are not too affected by COVID-19, um, this year, we should be able to accomplish most of our goals that are required drilling. And uh, Chris has been uh, leading the charge to make sure that we have the infrastructure and the ability to create a drill program of this scale. Uh, for those of you who may not know Cisco, um, we have an internal policy which stand, we call SUDS, which stands for Shut Up and Drill Stupid, um, because we believe all wealth is created at the drill bit and mine development and mining is really a, a de-risking operation after you've discovered the wealth. Um, so, you know, we continue to push hard to be uh, be one of the big explorers in, in terms of brownfield exploration and really to, uh, to dominate these camps and unlock value for our shareholders uh, by doing projects that, uh, that will be matter. Uh, this considered world-class is about 6 million ounces. We're there now um, and we want to get to that 10 million ounce mark as quickly as we can. Uh, we have the, the targets and the drilling. Mostly what we need to do is to drill below the existing resource uh, to get us there. And uh, Chris and his team is, are well underway to doing that. 
a bit of the timeline as we got so far to this. Um, you know, and really 2021 uh, is our kind of our, our transition year as we get back into production at Bonanza Ledge and we add the uh, we add the rest of the drilling to get the feasibility study. Uh, we've already purchased, as I said, a 7,500 ton a day circuit uh, that we'll be implementing in this new mill build. Um, we'll you commission it at 4,750, but obviously we have uh, more capacity, assuming that things will continue to evolve. In our ESG program, uh, we're quite proud of this. For those who may not know the Cisco Group, we've always had a big ESG component uh, back when it was called sustainability. Uh, we were leaders uh, on the Canadian Arctic uh, development uh, in terms of what we did for our community to make sure that we left a footprint that the town and the community would be much better off uh, for having had the mine, even if the mine did close down. Uh, we created a permanent infrastructure around that. We also created an educational place uh, for a lot of people that didn't really have access to that uh, by being significant investors in training. Uh, we'll be investing in training with our communities here as well. Uh, and we're in the process of starting to build miners uh, and geologists and explorations on a local basis as we get forward. Um, for those that uh, may not know it, the town of Wells is about has a permanent population of roughly 200 people. Um, and it's, you know, it's been around since the mid 1800s. Uh, but uh, as we grow, uh, this will become, will become much more bigger component of the town than we are now. We currently uh, operate a camp there of about 150 people between camps and hotels and various houses that we've, we own throughout the process. The permitting is obviously a big sensitive subject uh, in, in British Columbia. Um, you know, surprisingly, BC has been permitting a significant amount of mines with silver tip having been permitted. The Bruce Jack is obviously the biggest one that most people know about. Uh, their permitting process was quite quick, actually. I think it was uh, it was 11 months uh, from the time that they went through it. Uh, we've already attained, attained uh, several milestones in the permitting process, having deposited and gone through the bulk of the public hearings and also obtained a... Uh, an IBA agreement with the Lataco Dene First Nations. Um, they've been had IBAs in place for exploration, but this is a fully baked IBA to go all the way through uh, to the per production portion of it. And they've been very supportive uh, and vocal in, our, in support of us, uh, both to the local government and also to the provincial government uh, as we move forward. As you see in the, in the bottom picture, uh, we see Chief Clifford on the left, uh, and we see our, our Vice President of uh, Sustainability, uh, Chris Farnass, on the right. And he's a very active guy and uh, does a great job uh, making sure that our community uh, understands what we're trying to do and that we understand what their concerns are and we integrate them into the project. This is a great picture. I always love this one. It gives you a bit of a feel for this classic old town. Um, it is a, a heritage site in British Columbia, the town of Barkerville, about 19 kilometers away. Uh, and we've been very involved with that community, with Chris being on the Heritage Site Board of Directors, uh, which is called the Barkerville Heritage Site. And I suggest anybody that's uh, interested in history, go and have a look at their site. It's, it's, a, it's a large town, has about, I think, 180 full-time actors in the summer. Um, and it uh, stagecoaches and all the buildings that you would have in a mid-1800s gold mining town. It's quite a, quite a cool place to visit as well. Uh, very good for uh, for children. A lot of school children in British Columbia end up visiting there. So we're being integrated with that project uh, and we're being a complimentary and we hope to have a, a, a joint venture with the community to demonstrate, you know, old style of mining from the 1800s as, uh, as and, and then up to date here um, where a lot of the mining work and the equipment that we operate looks more like a video game uh, that this generation would understand with everything being operated by remote control, often from surface. Uh, so the transition from uh, from then to now uh, is is really something that we think is going to be a benefit to shareholders, and also in our ESG component, uh, this will be a showpiece for the mining industry in terms of what can be done with a mining project. Um, and you see so you see the community here in front of the Wells Community Hall, and this building is well over 100 years old, uh, not that old if you're in Europe, but if you're in Central British Columbia, uh, it's quite old. Um, moving on to Mexico now, the San Antonio project, the latest project to our portfolio. 
uh, really quite a quite a good find. Uh, uh, was identified by our team uh, about three years ago. It's taken us that long to affect the ownership of it. Uh, we paid about 45 million US dollars for this project uh, and it was previously in, uh, in, in, uh, in bankruptcy and we went through quite a process to clean that up. We now own it 100%. We have 1 million ounces grading 1.18 grams. Uh, to put that in context, the average grade that's being mined in uh, and heap leach in the in Nevada right now is uh is is about 0.42, um, so it's more than double the average grade that's in production in Nevada right now. And we've been uh, intimately involved with the heap leach operation construction at Victoria Gold, uh, where we led the financing there, and we put up 175 million dollars uh, to get that heap leach up and running, which is now running at 30,000 tons a day and on on. Uh, and on schedule to produce a 200,000 ounces a year. Uh, that project is in the Arctic. It's at 64 and a half degrees latitude, just a just a little bit off the Arctic Circle. Uh, we're much warmer here. We're an hour and a half from Sonora, uh, and we're located uh, about 100 100 miles from La India, and uh, we're also not too far from uh, Mineral Alamosa Santana, where we're a 19% shareholder, and also. Uh, Alamos's uh, Mulatto's project is on the ski, and then to the west of us, uh, you can see the Argonaut Gold Project, La, Corolla, La Colorado. Um, this is a well-known mining district and a, a big mining culture. Um, production outlook: We were looking for 50 to 70 thousand ounces a year. Uh, we just uh, put out a press release about three days ago. Uh, we've secured a uh, 15,000 ton per day uh, semi-mobile plant uh, made up of you know top quality equipment. Uh, Metzos and, and everything else. It's being refurbished in Nevada. It came from the uh, Britannica mine in Nevada. Uh, it was built in 2014 and we're sending that down to Mexico so that we can fast track this project. Uh, so obviously if we're capable of uh, using that equipment to its fullest, uh, we would be significantly more than 50 to 70,000 ounces a year. And we'll come back to you as soon as we uh, get our drilling done to make sure that we can confirm what those new numbers will be but well, we really see this as early cash flow, uh, early mining for the bank, and again, super low capex at 25 million US dollars. Um, you know, to put 50 to 70 thousand ounces into production, uh, almost unheard of. Uh, but a, a lot of infrastructure on this project, um, in that it was a previous producer. Uh, a little bit of a footprint here. So the big, the big prize here is uh, the Sapuchi zone, as you can see in yellow. Uh, this project is uh, is headed. Uh, for production right now and some drilling on the go and we're just going to leach that down on the gray zone uh, here where it says proposed leach pad you can see the infrastructure that exists there already this was an sxw uh, copper leach plant so we'll be converting it to gold production but all in all uh, things are going pretty well here uh, and we you know we've set the table uh, well for what we think is going to be a really simple to understand straightforward uh, with a relatively safe and and and, uh, and easy to access infrastructure um, both the san antonio projects uh, and the barkerville project the, the uh, caribou gold project benefit from paved roads power uh, and communities not too far away and communities that are mining supportive so all in all i think you know we we brought the the the, uh, the band back together again uh, Chris Sloter is leading the charge on the exploration and drilling. Luke Lassard, who was our chief operating officer in Cisco Mining, is going to lead the charge. Here is our chief my, uh, chief operating officer on the mine build. And we brought to bear $200 million of capital uh, with no debt on this project and significant amount of infrastructure and equipment already paid for. So I think, you know, it's a pretty good summary of where we are. Um, David, I will stop it there. And uh, thanks, everybody, for listening and look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you, Sean. Great presentation as always. Let's start with Mike Kahn. Mike, good to have you on the call with us. Questions today? There's always a slight delay with uh, unmuting, so. Yeah, just a reminder, panelists, you have to unmute yourself by clicking on the grayed out microphone icon.
All right, Scott, let's go to Murray and then we can come back to Mike. Murray Vanderbilt. Questions today, Murray? Brian, did I get it? Where'd it go? Yep, we can hear you, Murray. All okay, good. good. Well, son, first of all, um, having been a long time investor in Barkerville, we always knew there was gold there, but nobody could figure it out. You guys have done a wonderful job, I think, of putting a program together, and I want to thank you for that. I think it's pretty exciting and don't really have a lot of questions. I'm just going to sit back and enjoy it for the next couple of years. But I, Well, I guess well, maybe one question. It just... It was so uh, spread out. I mean, they knew it was there, but nobody could figure out an economic way to put the package together and make it work. And maybe you can just, and in the original PEA or even in the updated one, have you got any thoughts about what the cost may be coming out of Barkerville, ASIC cost? Or I know it's a little early because you haven't looked at the final one, but maybe you could sure. just touch on well, you know, we we uh, we are aiming to uh, to provide competition to Netflix in terms of uh, making sure you have lots of drill results to look at over the next few years. <laughs> it'll be another channel besides Netflix. It'll be uh, it'll be Caribou Gold and uh, be featuring our star geologist Chris Loader. Uh, in terms of the overall vision for the project, it really came out of the work that Chris and his team did uh, in the early times, and maybe I'll let Chris comment on the. Uh, on how we managed to crack the code here. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was an interesting uh, uh, iteration, if you want, if you, that we went through. And uh, the most uh, compelling thing we, that got us there was really access to the old underground. There was surface drilling, there was a, kind of a haphazard uh, approach to exploration due to the postage stamp type mineral rights that existed prior to our involvement in it. But uh, but getting underground and seeing the connectivity between what we call our veins or our vein corridors that then develop into slopes for mining is what was a real thing. We realized it was related to a single uh, event, a geologic event that was uh, mappable on surface and in the drill core. And, and with that, we, we were able to then go all along the trend and, and see these areas we had to drill. We started drilling those, and uh, that was really what, what gave us the confidence and uh, was a catalyst to our to our investment um, as Cisco back in 2017. So, and, and that's led to the taking it private um, two years ago and uh, then bringing it back in the market last year. So that was it there. I think you asked a question about the oil and sustaining costs and that. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we've, we've put in our PA some of our uh, early costs in that. Um, Sean, you want to comment on that or do you want me to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we, we put updated costs in there and. Uh... Uh, those costs will be updated in the 2021, um, you know, looking for late summer updated costs. But I believe, uh, Chris, we were at about $800 all in sustaining costs. That's uh, correct. In, in, in terms of U.S. dollars, uh, that's what we are. Yeah. Is that so, with the sorting, the new sorting techniques you're going to be using? Um, there was an assumption of traditional mining. We didn't really have the road header in there. Uh, we did have the ore sorter in there, but not as big a commode as that. And we wanted to make sure that the, the the economics stood up as a traditional mine without the use of the road header or the ore sorter. Uh, but the ore sorter is included in the, in that number. But I think it's going to perform. Hopefully, it'll perform better than the assumptions that we put in that PA study. So it should give you confidence that 800 number is is a pretty pretty solid number. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, you know the scale of the project, where we where we we see upside here, is obviously taking more advantage of this road header to to bring in some ounces that are going to be accessible, and we really sort of distinguish, you know, the ore sorter ounces being things that uh, that are already you know we've done drift developments in, and we're just taking that that material and we're upgrading it for a dollar seventy a ton, a dollar dollar fifty US a ton rather than uh, you know drifting into lower grade material so we were pretty disciplined i think in terms of building the mine plan around uh you know easily easily deliverable numbers um there is quite a bit of upside to be had once we get underground uh there's several types of mineralization that we didn't include in the resource because it was too hard to drill um from uh from surface but there's some high grade replacement zones and that sort of thing that offer some jewelry box opportunities that are not included in the current economics well, thanks again, and uh, good good luck going forward. Yes, well, uh, stay tuned for season six. <laughs> yeah, we'll go.
Thanks for, as always, for your presence, Murray. We're going to turn now to John Hall. Oh, I'm sorry. I did get a question sent in from Michael Hahn, who was having microphone trouble. Do we want to do that? Right. Yep. So Michael's question was, I know one big advantage is the shallow depth of these various deposits, but what is likelihood that you don't just have gold along the 80 kilometer trend, but at depth as well? Can you talk about the isolated deeper drilling you have done and the results? Do the grades improve with depth and, and what are geological comparisons with other deposits? I'll let Chris uh, have a go at that one, but uh, obviously at depth, we haven't seen any end of the mineralization yet. Yeah, uh, we've been drilling. We, we approximately now got 49 holes at depth below any resource, um, down to the deepest being, I believe, vertical depth right now is about uh, just just shy of a thousand meters, and uh, we're still hitting the predicted vein corridors, eh? So those were we predicted where they would be at that depth, and we we punched down there, and we've crossed those zones and uh, hit the mineralization at uh, the at similar grades. Your question is: There are higher grades at depth. Um, we you see a general uptick a bit, but it's, we don't have enough drilling yet to say to statistically say that yet. Um, over you, a year from now, when we get get more holes underneath there, um, I'll be able to answer that question better. Um, comparing this to other deposits in the world, uh, these orogenic systems are mostly in, in meta sediment, so um, we compare it to things in the in the Victoria um, uh, gold fields in Australia. Um, you can compare it to the things in, in the in the Brunswick area and in, 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 uh, in, in Eastern Canada, um, uh, the gold deposit of uh, Kurungal in, 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 uh, in uh, Northern Ireland, which is Dalradian resources or Ryan mining now. Um, those, those are very similar. Um, there's also some, some similarity to some of the deposits in New Zealand too within the, in the meta sedimentary packages there too. Thank you. And uh, I know John had another question that he'd like to ask. Do we have John Hummel? Is this Mike's yeah. question or John's? I'm sorry. Uh, Mike Hahn's question? This is John Hummel's question now. I'm sorry. Okay. Got it. Great. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I apologize. Uh, what do you envision doing with your 76% ownership? Keep, distribute, or to OR shareholders or sell? Well, the, you know, the advantage of having OR as a shareholder is it's a very uh, healthy company. Um, the Cisco Gold Royalties makes about $150 million of revenue per year with a 91% margin. Um, the goal with the equity book was always to uh, to make sure that we took advantage of the uh, of the knowledge and the technical ability of our teams uh, and to protect the asset long enough to unlock that value. Uh, certainly, you know, in terms of the strategic value of that deposit of that equity position within OR. There's a few things that can be done with it. Uh, we can use that to bring in another strategic shareholder uh, in a secondary uh, where we want to see another group come to bear and bring a deep, another deep pocket to the table. Uh, we can also use that to trade for other assets and resources that may be uh, interesting for the group. Um, as we know in the royalty and streaming and project business, there are a lot of there's a lot of cash around, but there is not many very not very many good projects. Um, you know, so this is a, another trading chip that uh, that OR has, and also uh, complementary to what we're trying to achieve at ODAV, which is to set the table for this to be a, you know, a 500,000 ounce a year intermediary with eyes on uh, on going higher than that. Um, in terms of of where OR sits uh, strategically, this is pretty important to us, um, and we want to see this project developed. Uh, and see the, the the vision that we have on it, which is it's it is a gold camp. It needs to have multiple mines in it. Uh, so there's no particular rush to do that. But uh, you know, for, for strategic purposes, we have a lot more flexibility um, to pick and choose the the partners that come into this project as we move forward. Um, and you know, it's I think it's uh, you know goes to the quality of the market cap that's out there, the quality of the shareholders who are invested with us. Uh, the institutional with the first hundred and forty million dollars we raised for this company came out of the long only who's who in the in the in the uh, gold space. Uh, so it's a very good alumni of of shareholders have been with us in the past, uh, and they obviously back this play in a large way, uh, and they're also shareholders within OR. So you know within the 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 next level of shareholders, we have quite a bit of support support 
uh, to see what happens in this um, in the evolution of Barkerville. Thanks, Thank Scott. You. Yeah, I think let's uh, Howie Flinker. Let's try Howie if he has a question. He may or may not. Howie, question today. I have no questions. Hi, Sean. Hey, Howie. Well, I you know, invite you up the site, but uh, we're not going to quite make it this year. <laughs> Thanks, Howie. Being on the call, we'll turn to Heinz Toma. Can you hear me? We can indeed, huh? Uh, excellent presentation uh, from the big boss. Uh, that you are in charge of this project shows how, how important this uh, is for the company. Uh, I'm very pleased. Uh, do I understand it correctly that by about 2024, you might be uh, passing the 200,000 uh, ounce per year production? Or is that too yeah. long? Hurley, certainly the hope, uh, you know, we'll be in construction in 2022. Uh, 2023 will be a commissioning and, and a ramp up year. Uh, the way that the schedule is working right now, we are hoping to have a full construction release, release late summer 2022. Um, and we need probably around uh, 12 months to get the mill, the new mill construction complete. Um, but we'll be in production underground as we get into that. Um, so that puts us some time you know, commissioning the mill in the second half of, of 2023. Um, I think we show about uh, 72,000 ounces in that portion of the year. And then a full year of production north of 200,000 ounces is really the goal for 2024. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank Thanks you. Very much. We could, I'd rather be lucky than good any day of the week. We're gonna to turn to George Belker. George, question today? Just a moment of patience. I'm trying to get George unmuted. Shall we move to uh, Doug Loud, Scott, and then we can come back to George? Yes. Hi, very, very interesting uh, presentation. The two two questions really. One is, it sounds like you have your permits well in hand, as long as you don't run up against this federal limit of forty seven fifty. Can the feds change the limit on you so that you wake up with say four thousand and you're in trouble? And if so, what would it take to get above forty seven fifty in terms of getting new permits from the feds? Well, right now the 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 limit is actually five thousand, so we stayed away from the oh. five thousand. Um, and this is a relatively new level. They increased it from previously, um, I think it was 2,000 to 5,000. Um, and I think that, you know, the federal government uh, at this point in time, uh, you know, is demonstrating that they, they want to support new business opportunities. And within British Columbia, we certainly have the support of this government. Uh, uh, the, the, the roundup last week, we had some very positive words about the uh, Caribou Gold Project from the Premier. Uh, and uh, the new NDP, newly elected NDP government uh, that was in power as a minority government up until October 25th and then got elected with a with a very strong majority government, has another four-year mandate. Um, they've made no bones about it. This is a high-priority project for them. It represents jobs in, a, in an area that's been uh, economically uh, hardshipped uh, over the years. And uh, all all signals from what we see um, are that this project, because of its low footprint and its ESG approach, has is, is got more support than any other project I've been involved with for a long time. I'm not even moving the town this time. You know, last time I had to move 250 <laughs> out. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my other question was, these different projects, especially the ones in Mexico, are they in separate companies so that you can spin them out or pass them over to the shareholders without getting into trouble with the Canadian tax authority? Uh, yes, they are. I mean, uh, 
Sapuchi uh, Mining as an entity onto itself, a wholly owned subsidiary of uh, of, uh, of ODEV. Um, but uh, you know, I, I tried to be a tax tax lawyer at, at some point in time, but I found out I'm more of a miner. Um, so I, I will do the best tax planning we can if that if something like that happens. Uh, but typically in Canada, if you work with a plan of arrangement or a spin out, um, you can spin those things uh, out without too much tax burden, but there's always some leakage. Okay, thank you very much. It's really very interesting. Well, thank, thank you. you I, think, uh, I think we're gonna be a pretty exciting story for the next, uh, next five years. Looks like it. We're gonna to turn to our Atlanta investors. Doug, um, is uh, Dr. Wood still on with us, Dr. Wood? Uh, yes, I'm on. Uh, every time, uh, uh, Mr. Rusin, every time you give a talk, it's fantastic. And today's was just better than ever. Uh, you know, very impressive. I came in through uh, your Brett Resources acquisition into a Cisco Mining and then on to OR. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm just very, very happy about how things are going with Barterville and uh, very impressed. And uh, I just enjoy your your discussions. They're so meticulous and and I love studs. I'm going to remember that. Thank you very much. Well, we try to keep things down to things we can remember. Uh, we are, after all, engineers and geologists. Thank you, Dr. Wood. We'll turn to Chesley Morton. Chesley, questions today? Thank, thank you, David. Um, first of all, great presentation. Um, I didn't quite uh, get it from the presentation, but is this strictly gold or are there other economic minerals involved in the two BC operations? Uh, it's dominantly gold. There is a, a little bit of other stuff, but um, generally, I'd say 95, 98% of the economics are coming directly from gold. Okay. And um, a rule of thumb, I guess, on on diesel operations is that energy might be 20% of uh, total cost. Are you achieving any kind of economies with the electric operation? Yeah, well, British Columbia it has a huge uh, hydroelectric uh, endowment, and we're going to be benefiting from those power costs. I don't have the exact cost that we're going to be at, but you know, when you generate uh, diesel power for power for electricity, you're uh, somewhere between uh, 28 to 40 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, British Columbia ranges anywhere from three and a half cents to about eight cents, uh, so a significant amount of savings. Uh, there, so we'll be taking advantage of that. There's also significant amount of tax incentives and programs uh, that, that allow us to do this, you know, much like when you buy a Tesla, you get several credits. Um, if we can stick mostly to electric equipment and push the edges of technology forward, um, you know, we get those benefits. The other thing about going electric is if you're not putting diesel underground, you don't have nearly as much ventilation to deal with. Um, so, you, you know, there's a lot of upsides to being uh, very electric. And the new electric equipment is extraordinary in terms of how much torque and strength it brings to the table. Absolutely. Interesting. I look forward to the new slow. Thank you. We shall drill a lot, sir. <laughs> I want to, um, before we proceed to close. Uh, David, bring... I'm sorry to interrupt you. I did notice that I think George might be online. George, can you hear us? Okay. Let's go to George. George, question today? Maybe I misspoke. Well, he's unmuted, so he yeah. just a moment. George, are you with us? Okay, we'll get George's question and report back to you on that, Sean. I wanted to um I wanted to point out to our generalist investors that as the news flow comes out from the story. Uh, Sean will be doing six-minute CEOs to explain, you know, the technical to our generalists. So please, when the news comes out, please look for the six-minute CEO to get an explanation from a high level um, without all the technical terms. I'm going to turn it back to Sean for closing remarks. Well, one thing I did want to add is that, you know, we've taken the COVID-19 crisis and we've installed our, our, our uh, own test lab on site. So we've taken it very seriously. 
Uh, and we've tried to secure our community and our mine site as best we can by introducing a, a lab that gives us test results within two to five hours. And nobody's really allowed into the into the property or onto the site uh, unless they pass a test and we get real time results. So it was an investment of about a half a million dollars, uh, but it's gone a long way in terms of securing our community, our workers. And, uh, you know, that is, I think it goes to the way we think about things is we want to be the best um, in breed for each and everything we do. And I really thank everybody who supported us along the many adventures in the Asisco story. Um, certainly Barkerville uh, and the Caribou Gold Project are going to be uh, a significant amount of value creation, uh, as well as I think a lot of good fun uh, for shareholders as this project starts to drill out and we see what the drill bin, the, what the drill bed brings to surface here. Uh, this may be one of the greatest treasure hunts any of us have ever seen. So I'll, I'll sign off there and thanks everybody very much and uh, stay safe. Thank you, Sean. And I also want to thank Chris Lauder for coming on today, the president, uh, to talk about the geology. Um, again, want to thank everyone for your participation today and uh, wish you a very pleasant evening. Take care. Thanks, everyone.